I am unashamed. What about you? So we're welcoming Gary Glenn back to Unashamed. We were so good, Gary, on the last podcast that we just said, you know, we got to have more Gary as we get into this text. And so, Romans 9 can be difficult. You're so much better than Zach. I mean, <laughs> you know, Zach sits in from time to time, but, you know, let's face it, it's a charity case. We're just trying to help the boy. But y'all out. were actually running buddies, right, you and Zach? Oh, yeah, yeah y'all's family. Well, it started with Jep. So, like, in the second grade, me and Jep became close buddies. And the reason why is because we were the co-quarterbacks on the little flag football team. Oh, you're too young. Quarterbacks. Yeah. So you're too young and stupid to like have hand signals for the play. <laughs> so you just have two quarterbacks. You run me in there, <laughs> tell the play, yeah. then Jeff, send him Jeff the next time with the play. And so Isn't that's that funny how when you're second grade, you're such a stud athlete. And then at some point you looked at Jeff, <laughs> Jeff looked at you and you said, it's we a, quit. We quit growing. It's over. <laughs> we were vertically challenged. That's right. What happened to all our speed? All of us peaked in the eighth grade. That was yeah. it. It was just like, meh, you know. I remember Gary Glenn. Except for Dad, his his uh, great grandfather, or would it be grandfather? A, grandfather, his both the grandfather and then the uncle, mm-hmm. uh, Dutch and Glenn. Dutch and Glenn, yep. two of the finest individuals I've loved, ever run across. I love those men. So he came out of a. Heritage, uh, Jones mixed with a little Bamberg, <laughs> <laughs> and, 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 and he, there, there he sits right there. <laughs> I don't even know what that means. Phil. Go ahead. I'm just saying a lot of people underestimate brain power. <laughs> yeah. So based on people's heritage, they're like, well, I don't know about this. You know, Bamberg's a well, Jones. Actually, that where the was was your grandmother about? I know Bamberg. Yeah. They, oh, yeah. they both. So in that side, it was, was it two brothers and two sisters? Yes. Oh, so that's amazing. double first cousins. Oh, gotcha. But gotcha. the Bamberg side, I mean, like it was it was about fifty percent of them were alcoholics and about fifty percent of them were geniuses. So like, <laughs> you had <laughs> where you kind of what I was wanting to say. You <laughs> you hear that name <clears throat> and these parts said, get away from that. <laughs> <laughs> you want to make sure it land on the right. Yeah, side. Yeah, that's right. But you look at Gary Glenn, you're thinking, hmm. So genius. He, the blood, the blood the runs right deep, side. you know. Yeah. yeah. So, <laughs> just, just coming up, you know. It, after uh, so, was, where did Zach enter the fray? Because he didn't grow up here. Yeah. So in college, Jeff and Zach lived together. Oh yeah, so we, we remember that. Oh yeah. So they were my. <laughs> it's best a good thing buds. you were. Were you hanging with them back then? Oh yeah. Oh boy. So you, we were all into. I mean, all into sin in the same period of time. And well, really, I didn't realize you were in that group too. Yeah. Because oh, we didn't. Yeah. We didn't know you yet as a believer until until later. Well, and that's how it came about. So we're all into the same, you know, no good stuff. And all of us kind of got broken and came to repentance at the same time. In fact, you know, we helped, we helped Jeff. Yeah. (laughs) So, and and, you know, you heard the story we've told it before. Dad tells it great is that he, first thing he said was what took y'all so long. mm -hmm. Like, you know, he'd been waiting for us to intervene into his life. And man, that was very impactful, I think, to all of us. We were like, wow, that's that's pretty powerful. And then me and Jeff ended up, uh, I mean, we got baptized at the same time. Phil baptized both of us, okay. February 18th, 98. And for me, it was like, <clears throat> I just rolled in, started working for Phil. And, and this was back when Duck Commander was yeah. at the house. Yeah. And so the two of them are just chipping away at me for Jesus. But I was Phil's grunt during this period of time. Like he's always had, you know. We've you got all Dana. been there. We've Gary, all been there, man. Gary. We've all been there. So every morning, every evening, you know, go over, work with him at, at the and land. He brags on you and say, "Boy, I tell you, yeah. Boy, that Gary Glenn yeah. stout. Boy, yes. look at him. He's, right. He can he can get that thing up the hill. He was stout as a young <laughs> young buck. Yeah. Yeah, it's over. We don't have to play it anymore. <laughs> well, well, you got us all, Dad. We got it. <laughs> so that brought you, <clears throat> yeah. Your, your roots coming to Jesus, and then your degrees came later through via LSU. And mm-hmm. so since that point, what do you actually do now? <laughs> That's a good question. <laughs> now, so I'm I'm one of the owners of a, a mechanical contracting and service company, which is just plumbing and air. And so we've got a manager over the construction. We've got a manager over service. My job is to handle legal for all of it and oversee kind of each department and all the the money. Well, I will pay you real dollars <laughs> as you go home. Look over there, see what the number is on that on that apparatus. We, the coal where we chill our deer, and and it's real simple. How do you turn it off? <laughs> Where's the button that says "off"? Oh, you a have business just... transaction is taking place on the uh, unashamed market. We're, we're in the lair. They we have a freezer. 
that's malfunctioning. Yeah. So we determined that during the break a while ago. Yeah. So it's summertime, we're not hanging up meat out there. <laughs> so I, yeah. I said, Dan, what, what, what are we doing running this thing? I said, eating up the electric bill. I said, we don't need the cold room. We're not hanging up deer back in it. Turn it off. Yeah. And we're, we're right there. <laughs> we turned everything out there. It won't go off. <laughs> the off switch doesn't work. But money is coming your way if you can figure that out. <laughs> so and, uh, so you have somebody. just re-entered the grunt work for Phil. See, I, see, I, I just mean, picked it right back I can up. get it off with a sledgehammer. <laughs> yeah. I mean, how complicated could it be? But I, I can't figure it out. So I thought, well, maybe maybe somebody up the line. That's when Gary Glenn comes in. So see if you, oh, see if you can get right there. So, so, Ted, yeah. so you said there was a story you had about when you were grunting for Dad. What was it? Yeah, so... Uh, Basically, I was a grunt every morning, every evening going out. You know, at that point, we we're clearing holes. So every morning we'd go out and he'd cut trees. And it was my job to drag trees into a pile, which later we'd burn. Well, one one day we had Jep, which was a rarity, come down and another buddy. <laughs> yeah. Jep never was big on physical yeah. labor. <laughs> so we're we're sitting there, the three of us, we're watching Phil cut down a tree. And I'm like 15 yards from Phil. And I'm noticing, man, as he's cutting it, I'm noticing that tree is looking like it's going to fall toward him. Yeah. And, and mind you, I'm 15 yards from him. Well, as he cuts through it, showing up, it starts heading toward him. Well, Phil just takes that chainsaw and starts going backward. And I'm thinking to myself, <laughs> he's coming toward me and that chainsaw is pointed right at me. So as he's coming backward, I start going backward. And that was all fine and dandy until I ran into his truck, which was parked there. And there's no more backing out. <laughs> and he's still coming. And he's still coming with the chainsaw pointed right at me. So at this point, I'm yelling, Jep's yelling, our other buddies yelling, stop, whoa, whoa, stop, stop. Phil keeps coming until finally he gets right to me and literally <laughs> cuts my jeans where my wedding tackle is <laughs> and hears us and stops. And we're all shook up and, whew, you know, we're we're cooling down. And finally, Phil kind of reverts to himself and says, good night. Hadn't anybody ever told you not to stand behind a man with a chainsaw? <laughs> Yeah, I never well, had I, heard that phraseology, <laughs> wedding tackle. I like it. I'm going to use that. That's a Chad yeah, Johnson that's, line. Yeah, yeah. Oh, my goodness. So welcome to our world. It was your fault that he's back. That's, up that was my first take of that. Somehow or another, Robertson's especially fail, have a talent of making something potentially that disastrous. Your fault. <laughs> what are you standing behind me for, you moron? <laughs> that's, what he, that's what he told my fish day. He's like, I mean, I wouldn't be kissing the dogs. <laughs> yeah. I said, Miss Kay, that's an old saying, let a sleeping dog lie. I said, she just woke him up and he just attacked her without, you know, he just, and it was done. But it really, really, she's, up? Up, she's having that worked on this morning. So, mm. So you almost well, got be okay. you almost got a chainsaw circumcision. Yeah, what you saying? Like yeah. to me, the tree. If y'all were backing up and you ran to the truck, that it almost fell on the truck. Yeah, I think it kind of fell. He was here first, and then when he backed up, he got out of the angle of the tree as yeah. he's backing up. Yeah, yeah. Dad's a uh, dad's not really like he's when he gets going on something. It's like whatever happens is going to happen. You know, that's the, the way it always was with us. Too. Well, I told, I, when I was telling Missy about our water meter encounter and you getting struck by lightning, and she was like, her, her initial response was mine on that. She's like, she said, how are you still alive? <laughs> <laughs> I said, you know, I've asked myself that. Oh, I me too. I, I look back. Cause in my case, Chase, at least you had it where like that mom and dad were a little bit older. I mean, they were teenagers. Yeah. Raising me. I mean, I was a baby and they were teenagers. You know, yeah. mom's only 17 years old on a college campus. I mean, it, at one time I wandered off and the cop, a cop saw me because some babysitter not paying attention. Cause I mean, you know, dad's in school and mom's working. And that, so they asked me my, which this is kind of ironic since you're Jones, my aunts and uncles used to call me Alan Jones for some reason. Hmm. They just labeled me that. I mean, they call me that till they all died. Jones, you know. By the way, uh, since we are looking at <laughs> Romans chapter nine, uh, w one other point, uh, Oz, because uh, in the, these scriptures, normally you're not here, but I'm glad you're here. It is interesting that to to know what Jesus went up against, what he was up against, from that time on, Matthew sixteen, 
back before Jesus had died, was buried, and raised from the dead. From that time on, Jesus began to explain to his disciples, now listen to how this reads, that he must go to Jerusalem, suffer many things at the hands of the elders, the chief priests, and teachers of the law, and that he must be killed and on the third day be raised to life. Now, Peter took him aside, never, that's not going to, no way, he, he's trying to thwart the good news of, from the world. Peter's hot on the battle. What are you, what are you talking about? <clears throat> I turn one page. The Son of Man is going to be betrayed into the hands of men. They will kill him. On the third day, he'll be raised from the dead. You just start through it. We're going up to Jerusalem. I just, I'm in Matthew 20 now. He said, why keep saying this? Uh the Son of Man will be betrayed to the chief priest and the teachers of the law. They'll condemn him to death and will turn him over to the Gentiles to be mocked, the Roman Empire, to be mocked and flogged and crucified. On the third day, he'll be raised alive. Now, I just gave you three in the book of Matthew. You can go Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. He repeatedly says this. Well, by the time it's happened, the event has happened, and the disciples took off the apostles and started getting that spread out through the whole Roman world. Well, all of a sudden, about the time you get in the 50s, 30, 30, 40 years after the event, what Jesus said would happen, that's exactly what happened. Well, the apostle Paul is still up against him. He, he's trying to explain to him, this is for everybody. Uh, he, he you, you, your God that brought you out of Egypt way back, he's all nations to be blessed through, through Abraham's faith. This is for everybody. He doesn't show favoritism. You are. And there's the rub when you start in Romans 9. Mm -hmm. they, were, they were to, to this day, they're still just a little, I love them. My Savior came from there. You know, I told, uh, who's the guy on the, that got another podcast? Is Cicero, what's his name? Ben Shapiro. Shapiro. Shapiro <laughs> and others. I'm like, man, look, this is for everybody. But 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 I guess the question, my question is, based on Romans chapter 9, 10, 11, how, how do you get, I mean, it, we've been at this for 2,000 years, arguing about it, trying to get people to see it. So how, where's the breakthrough? Well, how do we break it through, break through? I, I mean, ultimately, it's the answer to every Bible question. It's Jesus, you know, but I mean, I think that's what they were dealing with, especially, and he's going to address in, in Romans chapter 9. <clears throat> you misunderstood your election, why God elevated you as a people. You are saying, well, he chose us and we're his, whatever, special possession. We're, we're saved because he chose us. And he's going to explain, no, you've misunderstood why God raised you up, why he elected you. The reason why he did that was to bring salvation to all peoples. Yeah. And there has been progress made, Dad, because you and I spoke a few years ago at an organization over in Dallas, I think, of Messianic Jews, yeah. which embrace Christ as their Savior, just as we have, but then they hold on to a lot of Jewish heritage and the physical part. Uh, but they also embraced us. They did. And not only that, they are there's their, evident. Their big mission effort is to go back to Israel and try to talk to every Jewish person and say, look, you need to embrace Jesus. Let's take another break. So we've established that Gary is a smart guy. That's why we have him on our podcast, right? He's he's elevating our the table. But I bet you didn't know this, Gary, that the average American has ninety seven points that they can add to their credit score and no idea how to get them. Did you know that? I did not know. See, that. I mean, we're we're teaching you things, Gary. That's that's <laughs> the beauty of the Unashamed podcast, which is so there's so the data scientist at a at a company called Scoremaster basically found a way to improve your credit score, which helps you if you're trying to finance a home, a boat, or something else to get lower interest rates. So that's the whole point of it. One member raised his credit score 33 points in just five days, which is pretty awesome. So if you want to try these guys, you're about to do a loan, get that credit score bumped up, you go to Scoremaster dot com slash fill the scoremaster.com slash fill and see how many points you could add on your credit score so that you can save some money because 
even smart people like to save money, right, Gary? <laughs> yeah. Uh, especially on those long-term loans. So check them out, scoremaster.com slash Phil. Well, you never told us why you were Alan Jones. <clears throat> yeah, I know. That's, that's funny. So uh, that, that was a clip. The rest of the story. So, I, so the police officer said, I'm three years old. I'm walking down the road. And he says, uh, wh- 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 where's your parents? I was like, uh, I don't know. And he said, what's your name? And I said, Alan Jones. Because <laughs> Cause you were three. <laughs> I was three. And I was walking down the road. And so he said, can you take me to where you live? And so I, I, you know, it wasn't far, but I was pointing over there. So he took me back to Vetville. Then he reamed out. Mom said, you know, I don't remember yeah. this. Mom said he reamed out this, whoever mom's friend was supposed to be watching yeah. me was in there sleeping, you know. So, so y'all are almost kin. We are. <laughs> Alan Jones. There we go. That's what they always call me. Yeah. So, so, uh, so dad's got us to back to this text in Romans chapter nine is where it, last time we talked about, we kind of gave the overview, but I want to dive into some of these passages today. And he says in verse two, he says, I'll start with one. I speak the truth in Christ. I'm not lying. My conscience confirms it in the Holy Spirit. I always like that Paul's kind of got to make his, you know, look, uh, this is for real. But here's really the context of why he did this whole passage. I have great sorrow and unceasing anguish in my heart. And again, I think that's so practical for him because of who he was. And he's was He's thinking Jew. back to being He was a, a highly educated Jew of all Jews. He was a Pharisee of Pharisees. That's yep. how he described himself. And then he says, for I, for I could wish that I myself were cursed and cut off from Christ for the sake of my brothers, those of my own race. Which, you know what? I've said a lot of things before, but I don't think I've ever said I wish I would. I would rather be lost and you be saved. If you would just get this, I mean, that's what he said. I mean, he said, I, I'd rather be cursed and cut off myself. That's a that's a strong statement. It is. That's why it really reminds me of like Christian parents who are weeping over a child that's. Rejected. I love that exactly. illustration. The that's only so time good. I've ever made such statements are when I was talking to my, one of my kids, mm-hmm. right? And uh, I, I went just. To the, I didn't say cut off, but I was just like dead. Yeah. You know. Well, and I was yeah. thinking about that. You know, I preached recently about we were back in Romans four about Abraham. In that moment, you know, where he was going to sacrifice Isaac, the reason of the resurrection. And I thought about, you know, Paul Stevens when he does his He testament. was willing to do what you said, what well, he, Paul said. He had already done it in his mind. He he was there because he was going he thought he'd just raise him up. Yeah. But Paul Stevens tells a story about when he first found out Jake had diabetes. And of course they're scared, you know, because I mean he had a bad. And so he went in there when he was sleeping. And he got down on his knees by the bed. And this is the first guy you ever led to the Lord, by the way. Yeah. And he got down on his knees and he said, I gave him to God. I was like, I, I, we don't know how to deal with this, but I want you to take him. And, and whatever happens, happens. And I want to be able to live with that. Then he said he was it so overwhelmed him that he went to Zach's bed next, did the same thing with him. Then he went back in there where Kim was sleeping and did it with her. And it was just such a poignant thing. And I thought about it. He did just what Abraham did. He said, I hold nothing back, God. And that includes my children and my wife. And of course, you know, now Jake and Oliver are doing great. So I, I just thought that's the idea here where Paul was like, if you could just see it, if you could just get it, mm-hmm. if you could just grab it. I mean, I was there. Yeah. And now I'm some I'm somewhere different. Uh, then he goes on to say, he said, the people of Israel. Theirs is the adoption as sons. There's the divine glory. The by the way, by the way, for you, I read that while ago. I, I've always, I'm not quite sure what he's meant. <clears throat> Theirs is the divine glory. I mean, I'm, all centered in in that Jesus is a, was a Jew or is a Jew. It, what what is he saying there? I think it's that. I think God's presence rested, you know, at, at times in the temple, like and the tabernacle. Yeah. yeah. So yeah, yeah. I think it's just like I think what he's just saying there is like you you were given a privileged place. You were going to be the seed line of the Messiah. The prophets were going to come through. Yeah. The law through this, people were going to understand. That's they were the divine glory of all this. Yeah. You remember when Moses would, would wander off to go spend some time with God, and he would get in a tent. And Joshua was with him, and it said the glory of God would descend on the tent. Yeah. When he came out, he was glowing, yeah, like radioactive. Yeah. So whatever the glory of God was in a physical sense, it 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 lit him up. You but know. He, but he's getting. If diverse. you walk out glowing, that's a ch- <laughs> check this out. Might want to listen to that guy. Mm-hmm. But he's getting a five where he says, which is what I brought up last podcast about. 
tracing the human ancestry of Christ. I mean, it's like you you produced through me, Jesus, right? Who is forever? I mean, he's God over all, but he's forever praised. I mean, I think that's you. You divine glory is found in Jesus. Now, granted, they were God's chosen people for a reason, but the reason was that all men would be one day saved. But think about it. If you spend 3,000 years looking for the Messiah and wait patiently waiting for him, and then he shows up, and then you don't believe him. <laughs> well, I mean, he well, was, but he was it's not difficult. Quite what they were, <laughs> why was he it was such bad a... bad narrative, I'm telling you. They just they missed the purpose. Throughout all their history in their Old Testament, they they missed the purpose, I mean, most of them. A verse popped into my head, I want to read it, because I think this chapter is a place where people go and try to just have only this, this select few saved and, and try to explain, whether it's the Jewish nation, which is what they're saying, which is, no, we're doing it this way, and if you're not from Israel, you're out, which some of them say that. Sure. There's nothing you can do. We were just born in the wrong place. <laughs> then you have people later on that says, well, no, it's just it's just those who believe, who who mm-hmm. trust the whole process that he chose, he predestined, he, he called. They're, only those are going to make it. The rest of you, you're just born in the wrong place and time. You're really the wrong time, right. you know. But I like this verse in uh, 1 Timothy, same, same writer via the Holy Spirit. In 4.9, it says, this is a trustworthy saying that deserves full acceptance, that we have put our hope in the living God who is the Savior of all men, and especially of those who believe. And I just like the way that's worded. It's like it's available to everybody, whether you're from Israel, whether you're not, or whether you're born in Louisiana, California, or Iran. I mean... He, he's the savior of everybody, and we hold on to that. Well, and it's especially awesome for us who actually believe it. Right. I mean, I, I, I think if we get that in our head, it's, it tears down some walls. When you said, yeah. it, you said it last time, Jay, or earlier on this podcast, that that's why the context of studying this is so important, because you got to understand who is this written to and why. And and it's very clear who it's written to and why. And so what he's going to do with the rest of this chapter is give illustrations of different people from their history, from Jewish history, that will show that it's not about your merit. It's not about what you can do. And all these illustrations are where he's going to go. So that starts this argument. And just just because you don't believe something doesn't mean it's not true. That's right. I mean, that's the bottom line. I think the danger that I've seen from studying this is you, you need to be open-minded as a human being. I mean, whenever you make your mind up, especially something as serious as your eternal destiny and your message and and purpose that you're going to have on the earth and what you share and how you're trying to help people, you need to be open-minded because we've all been wrong at, which, I mean, he spent three chapters saying there's nobody good. You all make mistakes. Well, we make mistakes just in our studies as well. But if, whenever you make up your mind about something, well, what if you're wrong? Right. Even sincerely mistaken. I mean, all of a sudden, something drastic can happen in your life on how you affect other people and even trickle down to your family. Because, you know, from what I read, I'm like, you don't want to miss that Jesus is God and man. Right. And the ramifications of that. And when, that he wants all people in. And that we shouldn't, when you look at all the problems of our world, this makes way more sense to me than anything I've ever heard on a political platform. It's like Jesus basically tore down all walls of division, politically, racially, yep. nationalistically. Uh, I mean, where, how, whatever you can come up with a different, he tore it all down. Right. The gender issues, right. I mean, it, every possible situation that we can say no we're different he right. he tore it down right. said nope you're all the same well it's really interesting because most of jesus's contemporaries in the jewish world had trouble accepting his divinity his divine side whereas <laughs> most of the gentiles had trouble embracing his humanity 
Because you see it start right off the bat. He didn't really come in flesh. Flesh is no good. You can't Gnostics, be. Yeah. And, and then you and you look at our, our our pal Dallas Jenkins. What's his What's the greatest criticism, dude? He's too human. Yeah, you're, you're portraying him, <laughs> which as is why I, 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 people are drawn to it because they're like, "Oh, this is this is actually seems real, right? This he, is good. He seems like he's one of us." But <laughs> yeah, that, I that's... mean, I read this verse. That's why I read it last time. I think it's really important because yes, he's the son of God, and yes, you know, we shouldn't be flippant about that. And uh, and there's a time to have a sense of humor because we're created in the image of God. So I know he has a sense of humor. I mean, I've made this joke many times about when you look at our bodies and the way we are and, and our body, soul, and spirit united, we have a sense of humor. Right. And to deny that, that God is not that way would just be to me an outright impossibility. We're made in the image of God. Yeah. Interesting little statement. Hang on, dad. Let's take a break. So, Jace, have you ever heard of, uh, or do you know anything about tasers? I don't know a whole lot, but the company that started them, Axon, yep. they deal in all kinds of non-lethal ways to immobilize the suspect, uh, from software systems to uniting police forces. Yeah, it's, it's one of my Have you top. ever shot one? Have you ever had a, have gotten one? I've never been it? tased. Uh, I had a guy <laughs> threaten to tase me. <laughs> And I said, look, I have the Holy Spirit of God, so <laughs> tread carefully. Don't tase that, me, bro. That ended it because he thought I was crazy. So this is, a, as Jay's mentioned, this is a, a non-lethal uh, protection uh, to, you know, a lot of, in most states, you don't have to have a permit or anything like that to be able to have one, whereas, you know, for concealed carry or guns, it's a little bit different. So it's a, it's a good thing to have to, uh, for self-protection. Uh, they're available without permit, as I said. Uh, get the Taser Pulse Plus, Jace, or the Taser Strike Light at taser.com. Use the promo code Robertson, save 15%. So that's taser, T A S E R.com, promo code Robertson. There are some restrictions that apply, so see the site for details. When the Apostle Paul addressed the Corinthians, he said, the message of the cross is foolishness to those who are perishing. But to us who are being saved, it's a power of God. Then it went on to say this. Uh, Jews demand miraculous signs and Greeks demand wisdom. Mm. So somewhere in there, you know, what? You, you didn't perform enough miracles? If Jesus did one miracle after the other, I'm thinking if I had been there, I'd have been kind of like Nicodemus. I'm like, you can't do that unless you were you are God. Right. And then and then the apostles right after that took up the same mantle when they were those first three years they were in Jerusalem. That's right. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. But so, but he said they they still demand more. That's the thing about miracles. Once you get hooked on them, that's if that's your only way. If you never cross over to where they lead you to faith, show us another one. Got to get another one. Mm-hmm. So where so how do we go through the verses? How do we pick out the high points between in chapter nine? Well, I thought. Dude. Well, I think we need to look at some of the illustrations. I mean, he starts yeah. out by because he says in verse six, "Not all who are descended from Israel are Israel." Yeah, and but, even before that, I, th- I mean, he the point is like, all right, the mere fact that most of Israel has rejected this doesn't mean God's word has failed. So He still kept all His promises, the covenants, the the prophecies. Right. They've come to pass. Right. So that, yeah. and mm-hmm. He's supposed to explain how. They have. So the first one he does is he uses Abraham and he uses Isaac and Ishmael. Ishmael's not mentioned, but that's in other words, the first thing is why 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 Isaac? Why not Ishmael? Which you remember who said that first? Abraham. And where was if only prophecy, Ishmael could live under the Where was the prophecy that that said uh there's two nations inside the womb? Well that's Jacob uh, and Esau. Okay, that's the that's gonna one. be the next one. But but yeah. speak to that, Gary. So w- w- why did the child of promise? Why was that so important to understand that it, it that had to be that way? Was it because of they made you know Ishmael by another means? Yeah. So I mean, I mean, just follow. So in six, he's saying God has been faithful to what He promised you, Israel. You you've just misunderstood it. Then in seven, he goes through and he makes the point. All right, the 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 prophecy was not the physical lineage of Abraham. 
that uh, it was for the the children. Physical Israel is not necessarily the heirs of Abraham. Right. The one who shares the faith of Abraham are his recipients. Which is why he's the father of us all. That's which right. is what he said. And he covered that in what was it, chapter four chapter or five. Four. Yeah. Chapter four. And we're not from Israel. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so, I, I mean, this is because a lot the, the when I was in Israel, the guy saying, "Well, yeah, you, you're saying this because you're not from here." I was like, "I know, but if I go your way, I'm just out." <laughs> he's like. Yeah, he was kind of smiling, like, right, yeah. sorry. Sorry. I was like, stinks to be that, you. That's what we're going with here. I thought we were friends. He's like, we are friends. I was like, but you're getting something and I'm getting nothing. <laughs> I, I guess you can convert over. That's what he was saying. I mean, we laughed about it, and which I thought was cool and had conversations, but he was serious. Yeah. Oh, I know he was serious, Phil. And, and I think he liked me because. I was one of the few people that I wasn't so offended that I quit talking to him. I just thought, eh, well, you've missed this a country mile. <laughs> and then look, and he laughed when I said that. But we were talking about serious things because I was like, I want everybody in. And he's like, but everybody's not going to be in. And it, it turned into who's on first, what's on second. I was like, yeah. And I would read verses like I just read. But right. He saved everybody. He's like, but everybody doesn't want to be saved. I said, I know, but he went, he worked through in your country to bring about Jesus so he could save everybody. He's like, but everybody's not going to be saved. <laughs> that was literally, that went on for 10 days. That That's, that's how it was. And that's why when you read this, you're like, how do I explain this? And he, and he's using these illustrations. Well, I think, that's why I brought up the repetition of the gospel, mm -hmm. him saying it over and over and over, because most people were saying... But you're not going to read it if you quit at Malachi. Mm -hmm. that's, that's, right. Right. that's right. They're not carrying it around the rest of it. That's right. He just stops in Malachi. Yep. So where he corrects them is, he says, all right, God's promise didn't fail. Then he identifies one of those promises. It's through Isaac that your offspring will be reckoned. Right. Well, if you yeah. just take that statement, there's two things going on there, and I think this is what he's correcting through the rest of the chapter. The first thing that's going on is Abraham's offspring are going to be reckoned. That's number one. Yep. Mm -hmm. And number two is, I'm going to use Isaac to do that. So then the through the rest of the chapter, he's he's addressing both those points. That's one, right. who is Abraham's offspring? And then he's clarifying, y'all took the election, which was, I'm going to use Isaac to do that. Yep. I'm showing you that that's what was promised. Yeah. And, and the yeah. perfect illustration from that is back when we taught John, you go back to John 8, and you see that whole conversation Jesus had with those Jewish people who said they believed in him. And until he started talking about Abraham, they were like, well, we're slaves of anyone. What are you, why, why are you saying that about us? And then he ends it by saying, before Abraham was born, I am. Meaning this whole time it was about the promise. Mm -hmm. You yeah. didn't believe him. You don't believe me. They were claiming Abraham as their father meaning that their physical heritage, but what they didn't understand was he was your father because he was faithful. Yeah, I mean, that's but, what they should have But they I missed, think you they missed the they, faith They part. missed the faith. Well, and because the faith part's hard. It when is. You think about what Abraham <laughs> did. He said, go to a place you've never been before. But you just think, somebody taps you on the shoulder and says, look, I got a revelation from God. You need to move. I want you to move. Take your to, whole family. Pick, pick your whole family, and I want you to go to the North Pole. <laughs> No, even worse. Look, Phil, I, I, want I know you, to, you. You're like, I'm out. <laughs> <laughs> I want you to go to a place that I'll tell you when you get there well, is where you need just to be. Head north. How about that? <laughs> yeah, head north. And, and then, look, and then I'm going to, you're going to have a baby along the way. You're looking around like, this is before the blue pills. <laughs> and, you know? And That's then, why the then, woman is laughing. <laughs> Yeah. And then, so yeah. oh, lo and behold, the baby does come. So then you're like, well, if he can pull this off, maybe. Now, granted, I'm sure that gave him a spark, just enjoying the process. Yep. And all right, things are possible here. But then to say, okay, sacrificing. Well, I mean, that uh, you'd have to say, this guy is crazy. I mean, you would think, what are you talking about? I thought all nations going to be blessed through his seed line. I mean, all of a sudden, this faith becomes a lot harder than it seemed if you were in that moment. Well, that's that, true. That's what I love. Let's take another break. 
So, Gary, you're a, a part of a small business. What, what do you guys do for human resources? Do you have an actual person? It falls on me. Oh, you are the HR guy. <laughs> ah, well, that's really interesting because one of our uh, sponsors is a company called Bambi, and they appeal to small businesses so you don't have to hire a guy or maybe wear a lot of hats, which mm-hmm. it sounds like what you're doing. So they set it up where you can go online. Uh, it's month to month, no hidden fees. You can cancel any time. They'll customize your policies for your business. It's $99 a month, which is a lot cheaper probably than hiring a Gary Glenn. Mm-hmm. Uh, but uh, they're a great company, Bambi. You get a free HR audit if you go visit them at Bambi.com, B-A-M-B-E-E.com slash Robertson. Get that free audit, Bambi.com slash Robertson. But it's Bam to the B-E-E. <laughs> I've heard, have you heard that was other people? I like that, that yeah. little slogan. Bam to the B-E-E. There you go. It's a good way to remember it. Bambi.com slash Robertson. That's what I love about the story of Abraham is because he shows his his flaws like any of us. You know, that he got a little impatient because he was like, Well, I know what God said. He believed it. Mm-hmm. But then when Sarah came and said, You know what? You know what I think God really meant for you to take my maidservant and marry her and have a son through because it's still coming from your body. I could hear the whole discussion. He did say from your body, right? I mean, I know she gets a lot of flack for having that conversation, but at this point, once these miracles start happening, right, I'd pretty much be open to anything. <laughs> you know, I, I really would. Yeah. Like, man, try her. <laughs> <laughs> you know what I mean? Well, what I'm saying the is... The rules and laws have come down, which is my point about this. You can't live under law. I mean, God is... He's supernaturally right. above any kind of law-keeping system that you think you were going to accomplish something by keeping all the rules that you can't keep anyway. Just well, and, but the point is, Paul's point by him bringing this up, is that by Jewish law, I mean, it, the blessing, it, Ishmael was the first son. Mm-hmm. That's what was so ironic. And so, and he's got to be 13 years old now. So, I mean, 13 years have gone by. And then God said, oh, by the way, one last thing before I leave. Next year, that child of promise we talked about, you, you and Sarah are going to have the him. Yeah. And but they that, were like, what? I, I mean, like, and he said, if only Ishmael could live on the boat. In other words, I already got a son. Why do we need to do it? Because you have to believe in me, not in your ability to do it yourself. I mean, I've always thought but that. See, I great. think that's why they led to that point. Because my point is, they they if you're looking at it from their, forget what you read in the story. If you're looking at it from their perspective, they're like, wait a minute, he's changing the laws of nature here. That's right. And so, well, if you're thinking like that, well, he also wrote this law the law that we have to keep. Evidently, he can change that, too. I mean, he because he's changing the natural law. Or, or cancel it. Or or cancel it. Or, that's why I'm saying all of a sudden you start thinking. You know, the old cancellation the, of the written code in Colossians 2, that's a heavy one because to to a Jew, he's like, do what? It'll turn into mayhem. You've got to have the rules. We got to know what to do. But my overall point is that's what led them to an open mind, to thinking outside of what they were raised in. Because they're seeing this, these things happen, and they're like, well, wait a minute. God is becoming his characteristics, all-powerful, all-knowing. It, it's coming out, like, visibly. So let's be honest here and try to come up with a figure. So from the... From the time these events were going down, the timeline's pretty, pretty, pretty good. It's you know mid fifties. What we're reading, it's mid fifties, thirty years after Jesus or so, twenty five, whatever. You look at that. So Oz, to the Jewish our Jewish brothers that we love, the Jews as a people that we love. How do we get this? How do we get this? Clarify these these issues because percentage wise, how many do you think have embraced Jesus, him becoming flesh, dying on well, for dying knows, for all the knows the figure, but I mean what, what do you think? I, mean, I like your question. How do you have conversations? I mean I guess you do what we're doing. He wrote it down. Well and you do what you did. Reason. I mean you, you went to Israel and you had a conversation with a guy. No no you many, know, multiple, and, multiple. And, but if he you was, blackball the New Testament that well, would make it. You look at what Paul's doing here. I mean, like <clears throat> through the Holy Spirit, he's he's showing them like you've misunderstood my promises to Israel, 
it, y- yes, it's through Isaac that your offspring is going to be reckoned. There's two things there. One, Abraham's going to be Abraham's offspring will be reckoned or ransomed, rescued. Right. And two, I'm going to use Isaac to do that. And he shows them you've misunderstood it. You number one, you thought you in that promise, you thought physical Israel was Abraham's offspring. Number one, I'm going to show you you're wrong on that. Correct. And then number two, and then I'm going to show you my purpose was always in elevating you that I'm going to use Isaac to do that. That's why you stood in this privileged position because you were going to be bring salvation to the world. But, but then he, but then he what's confusing I think to people is because then he uses Jacob and Esau, who he, are Isaac's sons, which were the twins. two nations. The illustration represented the two nations, right? Right. So people go off the rails because they're like, well, why would he, why would he even create them if he's not gonna? Bless them, if they're not gonna follow him, and then you bring up Pharaoh, and he's like, well, before, well, before you leave Jacob and Esau, again, Esau was born first, even though they were twins, and so again, by law, by what they've all been told, he would have to be the one to receive the blessing. But God said, nope, not gonna do that. Jacob's gonna get the blessing, and his point was, there's two babies in a womb. It wasn't up to them to decide. God decided. Mm-hmm. And that's th- this comes back to his sovereignty again and again and again. And that's where the questions come in. I was only bringing up the question because I'm like, you have these three illustrations or, or they're Yeah, most and Pharaoh is a big one we need to talk about. Yeah, well, because I'm like, but they're confusing because right. the, everything that happened with Abraham was positive. Well, then it seems like it's not as positive with the two. That's right. Uh, Jacob and Esau. And then we have Pharaoh. Where's something positive about that? From their mindset, because right. they're like, it says he, you know, he hardened his heart to use him in a positive way. Well, then that gets confusing to people. Yeah, it is hard for people mm-hmm. to grasp that. Well, and I think like so he addresses all those points in Romans nine. Yeah. So like the, well, they got elevated. Uh, Jacob got elevated, and Esau didn't. I mean, God then addresses that in Romans nine. Yeah. Hey, yeah. we got a lump of clay. Some of it I'm going to pull out, and it's going to be for a special purpose. And some mm-hmm. of it's just going to be for common use. That don't mean I don't love them. Yeah, I, that's right. You've misunderstood what it mean to be, meant to be elect or to be chosen. Mm-hmm. Give, let me give you an example. Pharaoh, I chose him. I raised him up. Why? So that my glory might be displayed. That's right. In Pharaoh, the election, it doesn't even, there's no fooling around that it was uh, beneficial. Like God, yeah. God used Pharaoh. He elected him. I raised you up for this purpose. And what he's trying to get him to see is Israel, I did the same with you. I raised you up for the purpose because you were going to be the Isaac through whom Abraham's offspring exactly. were going to be reckoned. Yeah, that's it. So he, does, like, he says the same thing later with Nebuchadnezzar. He says the same thing. This is a this is a Gentile, terrible person that's brought all those Israelites to Babylon. He said, I raised you up so that a remnant would understand. And then through Daniel and everything. Mm-hmm. So he's done well, it over and one over. Of the Hang good- on, Jess. Let's take our last break. One of the good things you did in your studies, you had all those verses down where it says, and somebody can Google search it, where it says Pharaoh's heart was hardened. But it was only after a few times where it said his heart was already hard, Mm -hmm. and God just strengthened that hardness, which is hard for us to wrap our heads around. Well, why why is God doing that? What's the purpose? But to me, in my simple brain, it makes sense, because I'm like, here you have these plagues, you know, how how long does it take for you to get it that, oh, there's a God, you're not him? Uh, ten, and, about 10. Well, but I think God <laughs> strengthened his hard heart right. to allow all that to happen. Because re- realistically, you after a couple, I mean, I'll tell, you, I'll tell you one thing right now. If I saw one, the first miracle, I'm like, okay, this guy's got an army of insects and... <laughs> skills <laughs> that I'm not going to win <laughs> here because that's what always intrigued me about that night with the frogs because I'm I'm drawn to frogs because they're so delicious. <laughs> and I thought, boy, you know, for a second, this would be awesome. <laughs> I mean, hey, hey, hey. but then when you look at it practically, you're like, this is a miraculous defy of, of nature and you got frogs everywhere. And remember when it, they came to him and asked him, he had this conversation with God about when he would get relief. 
And it was a sermon I heard uh, Jeff Walling preach on. The title of it was, because then Pharaoh's response was, one more night with the frogs. I mean, he said, I'll, I'll, God said, I'll give you relief. And he's like, well, tomorrow we'll do this. And so indirectly he's saying, one more night of this misery. (laughs) And I always thought, why in the world would you do that if God was offering you relief? And that once I read it in Romans 9 here, and I get the bigger picture for what's going to happen for all people to be saved, I'm like, I think God strengthened his hard heart to allow all that to happen, to realize the wrath that happens when you're separated from God and to appreciate more the gift that happened through history yeah. that brought Jesus. And just practically fast forward 40 years from that point when he's doing that with Pharaoh, Israel finally gets out of the desert. They go to start conquest of the land. Their first city is Jericho. Jericho. Mm-hmm. They march around, they send the spies in and they go to Rahab. Rahab, under, she, she's like, I've already heard what God did for y'all in that's, Egypt. That's right. Like the, the, the inhabitants of the land that they 40 years later went and conquested, like they were already aware of the mighty acts and, and glory of God 40 years prior that that's occurred right. in Egypt. Mm. So it's like even in that, he's preparing the way for Israel to be a nation, for yeah. the law to come, the prophets to come, and ultimately the Messiah, Jesus Christ, to save you. And yeah. she said, yep. she said, your God is my God. I mean, she made a statement of mm-hmm. faith and then put her life on the line to defend her faith. It's so interesting, though. I think we miss these things because I had a buddy of mine call me and he's like, man, I, this preacher son, he preached about uh, Rahab. And he's like, when he got to her telling a lie, he's just like, now look, that was not from God. And I was like, I don't know if I agree with that. <laughs> you know, <That's> right. <laughs> uh, I was like, because he knows the heart. And he's like, Not according to this guy. He was like, now, even though God made it work, that's not an excuse to lie. And I was like, that, 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 this preacher's missed it. He missed it. I was like, because I was getting angry, you know, by hearing it, because he was trying to justify what I was telling my buddy. I said, it sounds like to me, he's got some, some legalism problems. And he's trying to justify keeping the law technically without right. God looking at the heart. No, what what Rahab did, I, I said, she's in the hall of faith. <laughs> and he's going to stop his sermon she's and say, in- don't justify this lie. It was not from God. I was like, he he's missed the point. And I would even take a step further and say that that lie, that is what showed her faith was real. Because mm-hmm. she was, she look, she's on the line. If the king finds out she lies, she's mm-hmm. dead. I mean, that was a death sentence for her to tell that lie. And even, all right, so back it up. Okay, so if Rahab's lie, if that's how you take it, what about the spies' lie? Mm -hmm. Because they didn't come in and say, hey, we're Israelites. (laughs) They were lying in their appearance. (laughs) That's what being a spy (laughs) is. And God sent them in to do that. That's right. It's great. But you know, Phil said in between uh, uh, the break while ago about how many letters that we get about people saying that we're crazy for saying that we're under grace, not any law. Right. And so I think that's what the problem is. People just have difficulty not, not being under law. We're, we're, we're under the law of faith. There, there's, there's a difference between the law of merit, of what you can earn this, Mm -hmm. but it is a law of faith. Trust God. Good point. It's a, it's a, and, yeah. and that's it's what, a change of legal regimes to right. get into yeah. a lawyer. Which yeah. is the whole point he did in chapter 6. He mm-hmm. was saying, we have traded out being a slave to sin, and now we're a slave to righteousness. Which is I, why I brought up why you do something matters. Because you go back to Luke 15, where you had the two sons. Well, this guy's like, give me my inheritance. He goes out there, acts like an idiot. Everybody identifies with him. Well, what about the guy back home? Well, his law keeping was awesome. He stayed out of trouble. But he wasn't viewed favorably. Why? Because why he was keeping the law was not right. Yeah. The law of the law of work says you earn, you you get what you earn. The law of faith says, love God. Yeah. Love each other. That's the code. But he was keeping himself from doing wrong things so that he would be elevated as well, look at the picture. Look who I am. Look at the yeah. picture of the difference in Matthew 19, rich young ruler versus Luke 19 and Zacchaeus. Because the rich young ruler had it going on. 
And all this, I was like, whoa, this guy. But what happened? He walks away sad because he was a man of great will. So Kiss, little you know, tax collector that everybody hated, he climbs up a tree just to get a better look. Jesus looks up and says, I'm coming to your house today. And he yeah. did. And you know what Zacchaeus said? I'll give four times back what I've stolen from people. Mm-hmm. That's what a heart does when it responds the right way. And, and the the external law, you know, think about the Jewish law or whatever, a law that looks at what you're doing externally is always more limited than judging someone on their intentions. Yeah. That's the that's the whole point of the Sermon on the on the Mount. I didn't come to dis, to destroy the law. I've come to fulfill it. That's right. What I'm demanding is going to be way more. Which is harder? Don't murder or don't even hate somebody in your heart? Yeah. Which is harder? Don't commit a, adultery or don't even look at a woman lustfully? That's right. yeah. It's far more demanding. Great point. Far yeah. more demanding. In fact, here's what he so, said in chapter 10, verse 4, which we'll get to. Christ is the end of the law so that there may be righteousness for everyone who believes. I mean, it all flowed into him, mm-hmm. and which is the whole point that we've been saying. You know, McGuigan made a good point, Jason, in, in this text of, of chapter 9 that I hadn't thought about before, because Paul used a lot of illustrations, but he used Elijah when Elijah, you know, felt so defeated because, I mean, God had just done this amazing miracle, and Ahab and Jezebel, they just, well, whatever, let, you're still going to die. And so he just went out and sat down and said, God, there's nobody left. You might as well just take me on. And he told him, he said, there's 7,000 that you don't even know about. Romans 11. Exactly. So I love that idea in there that that's, you know, that was a great point that we don't know what God knows, which is part of the whole point. That's why God looks at the heart. That's why he knows. But I mean, to me, it comes well, That back. kind of helps me with my former question about can they get it down to numbers? How many of these Jews have? How would you really know that? You wouldn't, but God does. Yeah. yeah. I want to tell you this. If you're confused by all this, I mean, I think you always got to go back to the overall characteristics of God in that he was faithful in in showing his love for everybody. Correct. And when you read something like Romans 8, 28, when you go back and say that we know that in all things, all things is all things. God works for those for the good of those who love him. You don't have to know every single detail about how he pulled it off, and it can be confusing. But if you're like, I love God with all my heart, soul, mind, and strength, and He's and you you know and trust that he's going to work for your good. Correct. What, what do you get, got to worry about? That's exactly right. I agree. That's a perfect way to end it. You know how, you know how we judge a podcast, Gary, whether we felt like they went good or not? How's that? How fast it went by. <laughs> that that a, went by fast. I don't know whether you have enough dollars in the stash, whoever's the ramrod this outfit, but somehow or another, we need to bring old Oz on. I don't know what he charges. <laughs> I'm just saying. <laughs> well, we'll do, when we have a, when we hit the wall, we'll bring Oz in to do that. that. Oz got a head on he him. He said today he'll work for hamburgers if you'll cook him. I got a I'll feeling they're going to say, how about a hamburger and a T-shirt? <laughs> 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 at least we won't get after you with a chainsaw anymore <laughs> thanks for listening to the unashamed podcast help us out by rating us on itunes and don't miss an episode by subscribing on youtube and be sure to click that little bell to get notified about new episodes and for even more content that you won't get anywhere else subscribe to blaze tv at blaze tv.com slash unashamed